Welcome to everybody to the last uh, panel of this conference. My name is Andres Olivares. I work at the Western Norway University of, of Applied Science and I, I will be the moderator for uh, panel six. So we have a very interesting uh, conference. Uh, today we have been, uh, we have seen many panelists coming from the technical uh, uh, point of view with companies presenting technology to do the commissioning, uh, port infrastructure. And yesterday we have also some people coming from the companies. But I remember especially uh, yesterday we opened with one presentation regarding legislation. And uh, in that uh, presentation, uh, it was mentioned the spaghetti scenario of the future. So what is going to happen with the subsea cables when this uh, large offshore wind park are installed? So this last panel is regarding the submarine power cables. And we have two very interested uh, speakers that are coming from the industry with ex experience on this kind of operation. So I will present first uh, our first speaker is Mr. Harald Poppinga. He came from SubC7. SubC7 is a large uh, company that uh, it's working in many aspects of offshore operations, but it's one special division is operated in exclusively in renewable energies. And that is what Mr. Pominga is going to talk to us uh, today. So please, uh, Mr. Harald Pominga, uh, welcome and go ahead with your presentation. Okay. Well, thanks very much for the introduction. And uh, thanks very much for the invitation to uh, talk to you on this uh, cable lay panel about uh, subs, submarine cable types and the installation of submarine cables. Well, my name is Harald Poppinger, Operations Director for CW7 Offshore Cables, uh, based in uh, Leer, Germany. I started uh, with uh, SubC7 in uh, January 2014 as Project Manager, and I had the pleasure of the following four um, projects uh, where we install the submarine cables, um, mainly the inner Raygood cables. The company did more, but I'd like to highlight the ones I had the chance to gain uh, some experience. Um, Amrum Bank, in 2014, where we installed uh, 90 kilometers of 33 kV cables. Uh, intermediate, uh, we went then to the UK to support on the Humber Gateway with the 24 cables. Uh, afterward, North Sea One, uh, roughly 72 kilometers. And then uh, Trianel uh, Windbark Borkum West, uh, which was an extension of uh, uh, also up to uh, 60 kilometers. CW7 is a part of the SubC7 group um, representing the renewable industry under the SubC7 group. We have the heavy lifting part for the foundation and substra substation installation uh, with our colleagues uh, SHL uh, heavy lift uh, in Sudamer in the Netherlands. I represent here today the offshore cable part um, based in Leer, all submarine cables and um, integrated solutions and um, overall project IPCI solutions uh, where heavy lift and cables are combined into one project are covered by our colleagues in uh, Aberdeen and in Paris. We see ourselves an experienced partner uh, for the offshore wind farm uh, projects and uh, gained quite some experience over the last couple of years. Our fleet uh, on the heavy lift side, we see the Seaway Strasnov, the Seaway Juden, but also the Seven Royales here illustrated with the jacket installation, uh, but also the monopile uh, installation and monopile driving. But uh, here, Royales, for example, the top side installation of a substation. On the cable side, we see our duo, as we like to uh, call it, which is in the Moxie as the installation support vessel to uh, deploy the people to the towers for the works on the tower, like pull in test and termination, etc., And the cable lay vessel here is the cable layer Seaway Amory. Uh, illustrated here is the cable laying with uh, touch on monitoring, which we'll say later a little bit more of. Uh, which we uh, see uh, in the next couple of days is the Seaway Phoenix uh, reactivated from the wider sub seven fleet as a cable lay vessel. It will be very similar to our operations that we have on the Amory. Uh, illustrated here the trenching operations you see the exposed cable after lay and then uh, buried here with a jet trencher, which we'll also say later, later a little bit more. Um, 
maybe a quick uh, look on the termination of or the, the definition of cables and uh, layouts. Um, we talk about array cables in case there's a cable from a foundation to a foundation or foundation to a substructure. So everything was in the wind park, the array cables. But then, of course, there's also the cables from the substation to shore, which is then defined as an export cable. Uh, you see different layouts, uh, and it normally depends also on the distance to the shore. While we see in the German Bight and the North Sea that layout that we have here, for example, on Hansi 1, where a substation in the middle is an AC collecting the energy generated out of the wind park, then export cable to a converter station, and then convert it from AC to DC to go to uh, shore, which is then more than 150 kilometers. Other wind parks, like in the UK, we have seen set up like this, where you have a substation and the substation is direct connected to a substation on shore without a converter station, or even like we have seen now in the US and in Taiwan, very relative close to shore, where you go from the last foundation direct to the substation to the shore. So different layouts and all, I say, depending on the distance to the shore, um, what the setup has been uh, chosen. Well, the main components, if we talk about the subsea cable packages in the offshore wind park, besides the array cables, we have inside here, in this case, now a, a monopile and transition piece uh, and hangoff uh, that is securing the cable inside the structure and uh, filled with resin to make it airtight. Where the cable is then uh, coming out of the structure itself, there's a cable protection system normally installed. We have uh, something illustrated here. In this case, it's we see the cable coming out of the seabed into the CPS. It's lying here on top of the scour protection, uh, secured then here in the entry hole of the monopile and then end up inside the monopile. The idea is here to protect the cable from any dynamic first forces here where the cable not be exposed as it's not secured like inside the tower or in the seabed. Um, that's why you have a cable protection system around um, the cable where it's lying on the scour protection or exposed to dynamic forces. Here a picture from uh, the Emery during cable lay operation. Uh, sometimes, um, as we see that also other wind parks uh, are installed, export cables crossing uh, certain areas, it could be that wind parks have then to install cables or we have installed cables in areas where we're crossing other uh, cables already from, from other wind parks. Um, in this case on Nazi 1 we had uh, mattresses to install to separate the new cable on top from a buried cable that was underneath. So besides the main components we see here you could have um, a cable uh, concrete mattresses, like shown here on the picture, uh, rock bags, filled filled bags, or even rock placement to cover then the cable which is exposed on, on top of the mattress. The main components installed from the cable package. We talk about the basics of uh, the sub... Sorry, I have some problems with the pictures. So... If we talk about the basics of the submarine cable, um, main difference are AC or a DC cable. The AC cable, um, normally three cores, while the direct uh, current cable, you have bipolar or even a single core. We see a picture uh, on the next slide. Um, the dif difference in this very rough guideline that it all depends on the distance of the wind park to shore, as we saw earlier, up to 50 kilometers, um, normally AC, up to 100 AC, DC. Um, and above 100 kilometers, like from a converter station to shore, uh, DC cables. Um, do have a voltage classification, 33 kV or 35 kV as a medium, high voltage up to 230, and then we go on a higher range, 230 to 800 or even above 800. Uh, the project list I showed earlier, that is uh, all based on 33 kV for the inner ray grid cable, but due to the increase of size of towers, um, we see now that the new projects are more on a 66 kV level. So the cables are getting bigger, of course, with the uh, increase of power being generated per location. The high end, uh, what we see here above 800 kV, this is more subsea cables you have for interconnectors between countries like uh, UK to mainland Europe 
where you transfer up to uh, 2,000 uh, megawatt uh, between the countries. But in the infield and offshore, we are around the 33 to 66 kV, and then the export 100 to 200 kV. The conductor itself in the core um, can be material copper or aluminium. Uh, this, this depends on, I would say, the, the, the pricing itself mainly. Don't see a big difference now uh, besides the price where it's, it's been chosen if it's copper or aluminium. And uh, another important um, aspect in the design of the cable is the insulation material itself, which is the EPR, uh, so more rubber base, we'll see a picture later, and uh, the cross-linked PE material, which we see more in the projects we have executed so far as um, insulation material. More on the detail, if you had an example um, of a subsea three core cables, so an AC cable, Power core, which are the three here in the middle, or here in the cross sections, you see the three. Here in this case is um, uh, copper, uh, stranded copper wires, uh, and also water blocked material inside. You have uh, additional layers. Here we have the insulation itself. In this case, is then uh, the uh, cross link PE, uh, same as on, on this picture. Um, additional to the power cores, you have the fiber optic cable for the communication and SCADA system within the wind park. You see that here uh, on the side, there's a fiber optic, or here on the top, um, where you have the fiber optic cable embedded in the overall bundle of the submarine cable. Uh, inside the fiber optic cables, uh, here in this case, a copper uh, tube, this protected with steel wires and then with an uh, outer cheese to complete. The entire assembly of a submarine cable, uh, you have then filler. You see here some filler material, you see it here also on the right hand picture, uh, with various types that have been used. But basically, this is to, during the bundle, to ensure we keep the round shape of the overall cable. That's why you have different, different filling materials here to fill the, material, to fill the, the bundle. Uh, you have uh, here a certain uh, layer of uh, yarn. Uh, outside, then you have this. Armoring steel wires, um, mechanical protection of the cable itself from uh, external force potentially onto the cable, but also gives the cable the strength as the submarine cable uh, while it's been pulled, uh, laid, uh, and handled. And then the outer part again, you have the cladding and PP gun uh, for further protection. We have here an example with uh, aluminium. Uh, the outer ring here is uh, just a display a disc that is not part of the, the, the cable itself. Here, uh, aluminium cable, here again, a copper cable. If we go back to the layout that uh, was shown earlier on the North Sea One uh, wind park, the inner field cable, the blue lines here, are the 33 kV cables. Uh, then you also different in, uh, make a difference in the size of the conductor itself. So we talk about 240 millimeters, which is then the square of uh, the core itself, or 800. Um, this is uh, different because you generate the power and it goes down the string to the substation. So the outer links or cables, in a, in a few cables from Tower Tower, have a smaller cross section than uh, the close, which the, the cables which are closer to the substation, because the energy flows add up uh, and these cables closer to the station have to carry more load, that's why they are bigger in size. Um, we also have a project for the Expo cable on this uh, wind park, which is from the AC substation to the DC substation, which we see is then already on a 355 kV. Um, level, also a crosslink, and then uh, these cables from the substation to from the converter station to shore are um, monopole uh, cables, um, but already on a level of uh, 320 plus, where you see a significant uh, load to be carried from various wind parks collected to this station. This picture here is just an uh, example; it's not to scale compared to these, um, but you see what I like to highlight. Here, the steel wires of a three-core power cable is outside the bundle, uh, while the single core, of course, um, has then already his own protection and his own U1 cable. That's the main difference. Oh, I went too fast. Um, just a quick look on uh, cable installation process itself. What we see here is the Amory uh, cable has been pulled into the foundation and it's laying away on the seabed. The main part during the cable lay is to maintain the edge curve from the 
cable the vessel to the seabed. This has been monitored with a touchstone monitory to make sure the shape uh, is in line, it's not overbending or stretched, uh, which could uh, cause issues with the cable. So that need to be maintained and monitored. Uh, but also a tension control on board of the cable lay vessel that the cable has not been pulled uh, to ensure uh, with this measure the integrity of the cable is a given. After the cable is laid, uh, can be or has to be trenched because the cable is, can be, stay on the surface and need to be buried. Um, within the German waters uh, based on the BSH, uh, you follow the 2K uh, criteria. So it gives you then already, uh, depending on the load, a certain minimum depth of lowering of the cable, um, plus additional project requirement for seabed movement um, over the years. I had one project where uh, we had 60 centimeters as uh, 2K, so that was a minimum depth, and then a meter on top, because the survey showed that the seabed movement in this wind park was uh, plus minus one meter. So even with the minus one meter, the 60 centimeters should still be given. So that determine the depth of lowering of the cable into the seabed. Here, a, sea here a jet trencher, depending on the soil. So normally you have a burial assessment study to see what is the situation of the seabed. Uh, I copied here the uh, YouTube link uh, and the, the wording for the link. Um, if you're interested, where the pictures are shown from a video that explains exactly how the cable lay operation uh, is entirely done. Um, as I just discussed or showed you in, in one or two minutes. Furthermore, on the trenching, um, of course, depending, as I said, on the soil condition. So if you have a sandy area or a clay or sand with clay pockets or even rocks, um, projects been mentioned here at the start, it was more sand with some small clay pocket, pockets, but we had also projects in, for example, the Baltic Sea, where uh, you find more rocks and it's going to be more difficult to uh, use the right or have the right tool to lower the cable into the seabed. Different technologies is lay the cable first and then jet trench, like we have done here with uh, more on the, on the, with the sea uh, sand um, location where you uh, fluorize the seabed and the cable is following then into the seabed uh, laying in the trench. Another idea is depending on if you have some um, more difficult sea area with more clay, for example, than to plow where the cable is deployed during the trenching. Or another idea, uh, what we have uh, done in UK waters on uh, previous projects and future projects, where, uh, for example, the trencher with a cutting chain or a cutting disc is used to uh, have first a trench in the seabed and lay the cable then into the trench. So that all depends, of course, on the seabed situation. Uh, as we talk about decommissioning here, um, what I see is uh, one of the main points, the structural interface. We have here an example where monopile with the outside J-tube uh, and here one where the cable is inside with the cable protection system uh, secured at the cable interhole. So here it depends on um, yeah, to recover the cable. Is it required to pull the cable out first uh, to, to the seaside uh, out of the location or to cut it at a certain point? So that need to be defined uh, which, which idea to use. Um, but we have also situations where potentially the CPS and the cable is not on top of the scour protection uh, where it's embedded in the scour protection. And that, of course, is more challenging because we heard it earlier, to remove the scour protection itself, there are um, technologies in place. But the question is, does the cable and the CBS has to come out first or what to do if that is embedded in the scour protection? Project I've seen so far, it's on top of it. Um, but the next challenge is, uh, during the installation, you have here roughly a difference of, or of the seabed, a meter and a half, two meters height to feed the cable in. But if there is no significant um, seabed movement, then you could have this entire area completely blocked with, uh, for example, a sand bank or sand that need to be then removed first uh, to expose the cable as a straight. Further steps on the decommissioning of sub cables, uh, survey of uh, the cable routes. Um, in certain areas, there are significant uh, impact of UXO, uh, even if it was cleared during the installation. Wind park operates for 20, 25 years. There's a potential uh, immigration of uh, UXO from uh, other parts of the 
uh, ZC area. Um, so I presume that needs to be done before. The same with the cable barrier depth. So it would be good to understand where's the cable, of course, uh, after 25 years, uh, but particular for the decommissioning work to identify how deep is this buried. Is it very shallow or is it even uh, very deep in the ground? This can be done with desktop studies or offshore survey. And I presume uh, the next uh, uh, presentation is also about uh, this uh, part. Um, yeah, we cover or potentially install concrete matrices or, or rock bags. We saw that earlier. Maybe some of these has been installed during the erection of the park itself. But over 25 years lifetime, if there were any cable repairs, it could be also that then the exposed repaired cable uh, uh, section has been covered with uh, mattresses, rocks, or loose rocks. We have some pictures on the side how these mattresses generally look like uh, or rock bags been used. The disconnection of the cable, as I mentioned, inside the tower, some work to be done, and then to define if uh, if there's a cut outside the monopile and the cable section inside the tower to be recovered, or if it's been pulled out together. If we talk about cost, I think that was the uh, opening this morning where, where that came up as well. I, I see the recovering of the cable of the seabed um, that potentially dredging and sand removal is required. This all depends on, of course, how, how deep is the cable still in the seabed? What is the seabed situation? What is uh, is it sand, clay, etc.? But then more, how how deep is the cable buried? Is, is the seabed movement uh, significant that an easy pull out of the cable uh, is, is not possible with the vessel and it need to be uh, exposed by dredging, sand removal tools, uh, etc. Which then, of course, is the additional vessel cost uh, that why I see that as a, as a cost driver for the decommissioning of subsea cable and recovering. Um, so what is then done uh, on the cable uh, corridor to identify the cable, to expose the cable at a certain section, for example, dredging. If it's exposed, it can be lifted out of the trench and been cut by a subsea uh, cutter. And then uh, you have the two ends uh, that can be picked up by the vessel and uh, pulled out of the seabed. Um, again, if it's need to be pre dredged to Ensure you get out seabed uh, need to be confirmed on uh, the survey. Uh, what I also like to touch on is the disposal of submarine cables. Um, every installation you have over lengths, and also during the installation on the tower, uh, the cables are stripped. So this this material we see here on this picture uh, is already part of a disposal chain. Um, so it's not something new or unknown. Um, this is already uh, in, a, in a process uh, where it can be uh, recycled and uh, well been looked after. The, the question is here, of course, we do not talk about a couple of hundred meters from a project. We talk about significant uh, kilometers of cable uh, from uh, decommissioning a, a wind park, which is then logistic, as we seen earlier, the bigger challenge. Um, we had the chance, uh, or we got awarded a project to. Uh, recover already cables that were just two years earlier been installed and need to be replaced. Um, this was done uh, last winter. Uh, we are at a cable repair campaign, so we gained already experience with our duo to uh, recover already installed cables out of the seabed and to replace them with, with new cables. Uh, so there is already experience. Uh, we got good experience on that project which uh, of course, and also uh, part of uh, future decommissioning uh, projects uh, to apply how, how this can be done in an efficient way. It was a quick uh, rundown. Um, I think I'm always already ahead of time, so this is good. Uh, yeah, thank you very much and uh, questions are welcome. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Poppinger. Uh, I, I think that the presentation was very interesting uh, regarding the technology and your experience in these operations. I must remind to all the participants that you can do questions in the panel, that is at your right in the question panel. I, we have already some questions, with, but we are going to address this at the end of the panel. So please, Mr. Popinga, being hold on that, there is already some question for you. But uh, right now I need to introduce our next uh, speaker for today, Mr. Iliati. He came from Horizon GmbH. He, this company has been presented yesterday regarding some uh, sensor technology, but now he is going to speak specifically regarding uh, 
sensor and surveys related to cable arrays. So please, Mr. Iliadi, if you are with us. Hi to everyone. Thank you very much for your patience. And I would like to thank Mr. Andres for good introductions and uh, also a very good presentations given by Mr. Harald from SUBC7. Uh, today we are going to discuss about uh, basically two different uh, subjects. One is the preparatory activities for removal of the cable and the other one is the engineering and modeling for, for this particular uh, basically removal. Many of Excuse those me, Mr. Mr. Eliati, uh, we don't see your presentation right now. Um, I'm just going to take the presenter role back and give you the opportunity yes, please. to show your presentation. We saw it briefly, but then it disappeared again. Is it showing my screen, basically? Request for showing my screen, okay. Now we see it, and you're good to go. Okay. Very good, thank you. So for those who has not uh, been yesterday with us, I'm just briefly going through the first few slides which has been presented yesterday. The preparatory activities and engineering for recovery of uh, submarine cable, basically. Uh, I'm the CEO of Horizon GmbH as well as Deep Sea Offshore International who is operating in Middle East and the horizons for European water, basically. Uh, our area of activities are indicated in this slide, which I am not going to repeat because the number of slides is too many, and our references of the project in offshore uh, is as follows. Today we are going to do uh, the presentation on preparatory activi activities, basically. Uh, what do we mean by preparatory activities for removal of the cable is removing protections of the cable in crossing area, cutting of the cable in crossing area, cutting of the cable near J-tube, I-tube, connecting the buoy to loose heads of the cable, basically, and securing the loose heads of the cable to avoid further movement, and if necessary, removal of marine growth at the at location. Uh, to do this uh, functions, basically, we require uh, the toolings and uh, equipment, such as ROV, diving, uh, it depends on uh, locations, the depth of water. We are preferring uh, different uh, equipments and technology. Uh, the ROV is, is uh, preferable uh, because of the active benefits over the diving, but it all depends on situation. Uh, we have two ROV work class. One is 125 horsepower and the other one is 100 uh, horsepower. They have done a couple of tens of projects, maybe 50 or 55 projects, basically. And also we have a mixed cast system to do in case there are necessary to do something with the divers. Uh, to have an understanding of J-tube and I-tube, this is a, a simple uh, photos of uh, actual projects. The left one is the, the cable status in J-tube and the, the, the right one is the, in I-tube. But this is basically for fiber optic cable, not the composite cable, which is uh, for discussions in, in this particular uh, DECOM uh, project. We also have the cables in uh, different um, part of the project, like a crossing area where uh, the cable might cross the, cable, the pipelines or the, the cables crossing the mattresses, basically. Uh, of course, we have a, a source, source of uh, protections for the cables or uh, at the crossing situations, and we need to remove those uh, mattresses from the crossing of the cable. Existing mat mattress protections need to be removed, and the sandbags, sometimes the, the, the cables uh, are protected by sandbags because of the less spaces. Uh, near the structures, basically. Uh, we need some tools to do these functions, basically. And uh, since we are going to cut, we, one of the tools are the cutting uh, tools for the ROVs and also the cleaning tools uh, provided also for the divers and ROV. This is a, a picture of a fully mobilized ROV with the cutting devices where it has to cut two different pipeline at, at offshore oil and gas. And uh, the, these are uh, in four slides you can see here. Uh, 
Uh, this is a movie of the cutting basically at the, the pipeline. I hope you can, it would be clear and you can see how the cutters are cutting the pipelines. Normally we use this one up to 20 inch pipeline for cutting. We have done this one several times and that is the proposed method we are uh, offering to the comes at the uh, nearby of the monopiles or at the crossing sections basically. Uh, after cutting of the of the cable uh, with the similar method as we done with the pipeline, we have to uh, float the end of this one with the float, so mark it with the buoy, and then uh, protect it with the uh, necessary mattresses or whatever is required by the project. Basically, uh, that part of, is the cutting part of the project uh, presentations, and now we are uh, doing a modeling for removal of the cable in case we are not going to. Uh, unbury the cable using uh, the special vessels and spending a, a lot of cost. But of course, we do not have uh, proper uh, data from the field. We have not received those data from become tools to understand what type of uh, backfilling has been used for this particular project. Therefore, we have uh, do the modeling uh, with the engineering modeling for removal of the cable without uh, having. Uh, like uh, rock thumping on top of the, the cables. The engineering departments of the companies doing the modeling using the digital assets such as Bentley MaxSurf, uh, using for different uh, hydrostatic analysis, tank arrangement, uh, tank calibrations, other uh, type of uh, uh, measurements, and uh, ANSYS Aqua used for the uh, stability analysis, hydrodynamic uh, systems of the vessels, and many other features. Uh, using SOLIDWORKS for structural modeling, structural analysis, structural cost study analysis, and, and so on. And finally, the uh, OrcaFlex uh, software using uh, to calculate uh, basically and to measure the risers, uh, hybrids, flexible umbilical, anchor patterns, as and many other projects. So this sample of some of the projects uh, has been done using these softwares and uh, the engineers basically, uh, the crossing support and mattress installations, uh, which was the loading arrangement, bowler pool calculation, transferring and installation procedures, uh, crossing support installation, which we have had uh, the loading and transportation procedures, transferring installation, hydrodynamic calculations of the vessel body, lifting analysis and support and minimum required rigging specification. Backfilling operation, we had uh, three years of uh, rock dumping on, on uh, a trench uh, for entire field of the pipeline uh, using 300 tons of uh, basically uh, material to, to make sure the, the pipelines is covered uh, properly and it would not be damaged by, by the dragging anchors and other, other things using this project. And EPO cable, uh, fiber optic cable pooling, which we had uh, initially few photos of this one on the slide for the presentation, SPM recovery modeling, uh, in which we have done the loading arrangement, flexible hose modeling, and DP vessel modeling, as well as installation procedures. Free span rectification, which we have uh, quite a number of this project has been done in one of the oil fields, and uh, we do hydrodynamic calculations of the vessel body uh, during this project uh, using a suitable vessel, sea fastening analysis uh, for the bunkers on deck, as it's indicated on the bottom left, uh, lifting analysis of the baskets and minimum required rigging specification for this particular project. Uh, objective of this modeling uh, is to calculate and analyze for safe recovery of the cable, simulation modeling of recovery of the cable, engineering report procedures for recovery of the cable. How we will achieve this uh, objectives? For basically, we will take the uh, extract the information, seabed property, route survey information which has been explained in a previous uh, day of the conference, cable settlement, cover height, debris around the cable, and with this, with this information, parameters uh, to be controlled on board the vessel, 
top tension, bottom tension, bend radius, and check criteria of the, of the cable, basically. We have been using uh, soil resistance, as indicated in previous uh, presentation by uh, Mr. Harold from SOPC7. We need to have the status from the, from the project. Uh, and if it is not available, we need to do the, uh, the geotechnical investigations and uh, obtain the required parameters as well as we need the details of the cable. So in case uh, we need to have a proper model, we need to have the exact uh, type of cable used for this project. And of course, the cables has certain criteria, uh, characteristics and specification, uh, which will be provided by the cable producers or the project. Uh, having all the data from uh, soil analysis to, to the cable, uh, of course, because the cable has not have the particulars at the time of decommissioning, same as the one it was uh, newly built, we need to take a sample of a cable from a field by cutting pieces and probably sending into the lab to do the required test and providing required uh, breaking strength of the cable so that we can enter into the model and uh, from those data, calculate the soil resistance, and the software itself will provide us with the with the analysis of the cable, top tension, bend radius, and design criteria would be also according to the DNDGL RP0360. The model is here. I will run the model for you to see. It's a short uh, capture, basically, of, of the model where we have provided certain number of parameters input to the to the model and we collect certain uh, data from the modeling certainly we have to provide with a uh, number of uh, input particulars in this case as i mentioned the, the cable is buried to the depth of 1.5 meters as an example we use for this particular uh, modeling. Uh, we use a cohesive soil parameters from the project we have, therefore it would, might not be equivalent to the, the one in North Sea for the wind farm. And we use a cable diameters of 140 meters millimeters of uh, composite cable. The software provides us with the, with the tensions and other characteristics, the times, and taking into account the result of this analysis, we can control the vessel's motion, DP systems, to remain within the safe parameters, and the cable will not exceed the breaking strengths. I cannot move to the next slide. Um, maybe it's a little bit slow. Okay. So these are some of the parameters has been taken uh, from the model. Uh, it's indicates how the breaking strength is developing within the cables while we are trying to pull it up without any unburial of the soil. And with these data, we could control the maneuvering of the DP vessel, who is responsible for collecting of the decommissioned cable, and then hand it over the same to the to the recycling or whatever. So this was my presentation, basically, and thank you very much for your patience. We have covered seabed survey, preparatory activity, and engineering cable for removal. Okay, thank you, Mr. Riliadi, for your presentation. Uh, I think that was very interesting, and uh, it does it doesn't it's not so easy as we may think about recovering the cable. There is a lot of engineering preparations that need to be carried out. Uh, and, and first, an information general to everybody: uh, we are over time but we have several uh, questions that are very interesting to discuss now. 
So I asked with the Marcus Pantin, the leader of, of our project, and he allowed me to just move into the next 15 minutes to address these questions. Uh, okay, so we will prolong a little this session. Uh, so first, uh, I have tried to organize this uh, regarding the different uh, uh, presentations. So uh, for Mr. Popinga, uh, there is one question regarding if one cable is enough uh, regarding the export cable. Is, is a plan B in case that you have some uh, damage in the export cable or is it's normally two export cables that are placed in there? Well, I haven't seen that a redundancy cable has been laid. Uh, we talk about redundancy in the load in the cable, uh, but to install a second cable, I haven't seen that. Um, okay, and just taking from that, can you see some barriers for cable lengths over 100 uh, kilometers? Um, no, I need to ch need to check on the cable because okay, cables we have seen uh, across the Atlantic. If you talk about fiber optic cables or telecommunication cables, so so that length is is not the issue. If it comes to power, um, I would say there is a certain threshold, but not aware if you talk about uh, uh, a significant distance now. Um, so we so have at the moment you see, you see sorry. no, you, you you have uh, countries connected. Uh, um, even Norway uh, towards uh, Germany, so there, there are significant lengths already, but uh, overall maximum lengths, um, I, I need to check. I have to, no. That's no problem, thank you. I have more questions uh, for you, Mr. Popinga, but uh, just please keep in hold. I wanted to ask Mr. Iliati regarding the technical technicalities. Uh, there is a question regarding the, uh, the maximum uh, diameter of the composite submarine cables and can you address that from the point of view of the cutting operation is there a limitation today basically for a cable we do not have any limitations there are uh, available tools for rov and divers to cut those type of cables but if it comes to the pipeline it's a different issues uh, because the pipelines are sometimes covered with different type of protections and then we need to have a special toolings for that one. But as far as I understand, there is no limitations for cutting off the cable using ROV or divers methods. Okay, thank you very much. And mm -hmm. just continue with you, Mr. Iliati, uh, regarding the lifetime of these offshore uh, wind parks. We are talking about 20 to 25 years. Uh, do you have some monitoring of the cable during this time or do you know if there is necessity to replace this, uh, some of the cables periodically? Uh, normally, uh, for the offshore industries standards, there are certain uh, periods of time when you need to inspect the, 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 the field and the pipelines. But in case of cable, because it's normally it would be buried under the, under the soil, uh, there is no periodical inspections, but there are places where the cables is out of the trench and due to shiftings of the seabed, sometimes the clients are required periodically to inspect the cable. So therefore, uh, that is uh, pro depend on the client's uh, requirements and the project basically. Uh, some clients are having shorter period uh, for, for these inspections, re-inspections, and survey and some of them mm, has a longer period for that. Depend also on how much cost is available in the project, how much money is available basically. I see. Uh, Mr. Pobinga, do you have some experience regarding this, uh, the possibility to replace cables for offshore wind parks? We have done uh, like and like replacement uh, project last uh, uh, winter where the um, same cable type, if it comes to the load and uh, voltage, uh, has been um, installed again. So not not on a repowering side, but replace cables uh, like to like. Uh, that's uh, something we have done. Yeah, that's experience. That I'd like to come back to the first question. Yeah. I, I just did a quick check. So uh, based on 2012, it looks like that 400, uh, 580 kilometers was the longest uh, underwater power cable based on the resources I found. So that is already significant lengths, in this case, from Norway to the Netherlands. Yes, uh, thank you very much for that clarification. Uh, 
but I just wanted to take uh, again this case of, of uh, replacing the cables was related to some specific damage or it was some uh, uh, maintenance uh, operation. Uh, there were some uh, issues with that cable so that uh, um, wind power operator uh, decided to replace the cable. Okay, nice. yeah, thank you very much. And uh, I have a question for you, Mr. Popinga. Uh, this is difficult to uh, to answer, but uh, it's always uh, uh, I just transfer the question. Can you talk a little about the cost of operation? There is a specific, specific question about regarding the the date rate for the trenching tools and so on. I guess that that is uh, difficult to answer because it changes a lot from uh, project to project. But uh, I wanted to take the opportunity also, if you can talk about a little up about the economic interest in recover the cables. Uh, do you see that is it profitable or, 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 it, or that is going to be economic interest in recovering these cables in the future? Okay, first I, I cannot share any uh, cost or any interest of uh, um, potential uh, project more than uh, to liaise with our uh, department to uh, come up with a proper offer. Um, the economics to recover a subsea cable, um, I, so far as I'm aware, there's a question uh, that starts more on the environmental impact. Uh, is it really required after 20, 25 years to, uh, to pull out a cable out of a seabed where it has been done for 20, 25 years uh, in, in a meter, two meter water depths? So is the disturbance of the seabed more? And I think it's a bit similar discussion what we have with how far a monopile has to go out of the seabed. Um, is, is it really required? I think that's, that's something where legislation has to make a, make a call that, okay, it has to be a green field and has to be recovered completely. Um, if so, uh, and I presume the question is then, is the value of the remaining cable uh, worthwhile to go out and recover? Um, well, it depends on all on the, the copper or aluminium price in, in, in 10, 15 years or when it starts. Um, at the moment, without having exact figures, I would, I would doubt that, that uh, the value of the cable will uh, cover the entire cost for recovering uh, a cable out of the seabed. Yeah, so you see that's a very open, really regarding the economy of the recovery yeah it, it's based all on uh, on the metal price but it has to be a significant increase but we see that on other metals and uh, resources um, we never know where where that uh, will be in a couple of years but at the yes. moment i i doubt that it's economical to uh, uh, get the cable yeah, out and that that is on the very good then we have your impression that we know also that the the legislation is very important here so there is two separate questions I, ha I have another question that is difficult to answer for you mr public and it's regarding recommendation of cables copper versus aluminium as, as you mentioned already that changed a lot from the price of the metals but uh, do you have some technical recommendation or in your experience uh, it's the aluminium cable more proper to damage or can you uh, open a little this uh, discussion there uh, I have seen no difference in the handling and the installation of uh, a copper cable versus an aluminium cable. Um, I had the question before and I've double checked that time when we have installed the aluminium cables on the Hornsey, uh, on the Nazi one, um, then there was no, uh, no notable difference in, in handling the cables. So this is uh, for me down to the economics of uh, the cable itself um, and, and again the, the metal price. Uh, and I'm not aware if there's any um, other issues of uh, performance over lifetime or uh, uh, load itself. So from pure installation point of view, uh, ha we have not noticed a, a difference. Sir. I see. I, I have a question actually for both, and uh, maybe Mr. Iliati can uh, start the discussion there answering. There's a question regarding uh, the multiple offshore activities. Uh, regarding these cables and the possibility to have some troubles uh, regarding these multiple offshore uh, activities. Uh, this was mentioned in fisheries activities. So Mr. Iliadi, do you know if it's, uh, today is there some monitoring about all this cable installation and how can this uh, uh, have an impact in other activities? Uh, uh basically i have not uh, very clear ideas of the uh, impact of uh, cables on uh, fisheries or other uh, marine activities 
uh, that has come to, uh, as an introductory into the introductory into the, uh, the some of the legislations as far as I know, but it is not confirmed. Maybe Mr. Ma Mr. Harold can help on this. Yes, Mr. Pobiga, uh, if, if you had some mention about technical difficulties regarding this. Uh... So there are also two aspects. One is environmental. Is there any impact of uh, operating a cable in the seabed? I don't know if the question went that direction. Then uh, no, I think that there's other two answers as operators um, to see if there is any uh, seen impact on the uh, sea life around uh, or in, inside of um, wind parks. I think there are studies already been done. Uh, if it comes to uh, impact on fishery, the cable itself is, as I mentioned during the presentation, is uh, trenched to a certain depth, uh, so it's, it's, it's well protected. Um, saying this, uh, it's never been uh, safe if uh, some uh, vessel has to drop an anchor during an emergency, for example, and uh, drags the anchor along the seabed uh, that it uh, penetrates uh, into the depths of the cable uh, and, and pick up the cable and damage the cable. That, that can happen. But I don't see that with any fishing trawlers or, or fishing nets. Uh, uh, but something else to add here is um, the wind park operators uh, do regular surveys of uh, to see if the cable is uh, still down to uh, the required depth uh, buried to the to the um, into the seabed. So during the surveys, which are done on a regular basis, a uh, couple of years. Um, they can see if there's any exposed cable and of course if there's an exposed cable that need to be covered to ensure that this particular part has not been affected by any anchor or capsized vessel that that maybe drags along the uh, that uh, wind park uh, to damage the cable so the wind park operator should have the survey data on a regular basis how deep is the cable still buried anything exposed and if there's exposed to uh, take uh, measures with rock bags, mattresses, or other measures to protect the cable again. I see, that was very clear. We are running out of time, but I will take my chance to make myself a question. So there is a lot of, for both of you, there is a lot of uh, announcement in the EU for offshore wind, how it's going to grow up in the future and so on. And a cable is a key uh, part of the industry. So how do you see uh, the future of this for the next 10 years? Mr. Ilati, if you want to start, can you can you specifically uh, repeat the questions because I don't get yes, it. Yes, but we see offshore wind parks are going to grow significant significantly in the EU yes. for the next ten years. So, how do you see your operations for your company in this context for the next ten years? Uh, we are just at the beginning uh, for the North Sea. We have uh, not had that much of experience there and we are starting our activities in Europe like three years ago and uh, we are more, mainly before focus on Middle East. Now with this wind activity, I believe there will be a, a, a future for us as well. And we are uh, discussing with the ship owners and with the operators to find a proper position in this particular uh, industry and hope we will be succeeded. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Iliadi. Mr. Popping, if you have some words about the future. Uh, yeah, we see a very bright future in that um, end. You, segment. You saw that in the presentation that within uh, sub 7 we have established um, a business unit for uh, renewables. Uh, and also uh, previously we worked with uh, one duo uh, and uh, quite soon we start with the second uh, cable a vessel as we see parallel operations. So we see a bright future, um, loads of projects around the world, uh, and uh, also we met it out of uh, North Sea and uh, Baltic, with the first project uh, been completed in the US and uh, also now present in uh, Taiwan. So globally, and the prediction of uh, increased wind parks, um, I see it as a very bright future. What would be of interest, and uh, I think uh, the meeting or the, the presentations here also touched on about repowering. That, that I think is a different discussion. Uh, and it, is, is it possible with the strengths of foundations and how much has to be done if we talk about repowering, which is potentially not just a new tower uh, or um, um, uh, a nacelle or a turbine. Uh, it's also a question how much reserve you have on the cables. So additional wind parks, very bright. Repowering, I think that's uh, still some work to be done, what is possible in the already uh, installed wind farms. 
that was a very good comment. Uh, thank you very much. So I want to say thank you very much to both of you for your presentation. It was very interesting and we appreciate a lot your contribution. So now I will say a few words to all the rest of the attendees uh, to this conference. Well, we have been in two days uh, of the DECOM Tools Midterm Conference. Uh, very interesting. We have seen different panels from legislation to infrastructure, technical issues, companies, uh, model developing uh, for uh, the commissioning of offshore wind park. So I myself, I am very happy about the level of the presentations. I, I think that were uh, very good and illuminated. And I just wanted to say thank you very much for joining us. Uh, if you have further questions, please take contact to, through our, our web page and just continue to be in contact with the Decon Tools project. This is just a midterm conference, so by sure uh, we are going to have some other uh, conference here. So for, from my point uh, of view, I will say thank you very much to everybody and this is uh, the end of the conference. So thank you very much and have a, a nice day further.